everyone. Again, I'm Dr. Saadi Adra, CEO of Advisors. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Antonio. Antonio, how are you? Uh, how are you, my friend, Dr. Saadi? Hello, hello, Antonio. How are you? Good evening. Good evening to you and to all the listeners. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to have you today with us in this interesting session. Uh, so let me start by again welcoming everybody. We have over 700 registrations today. I don't know how many will be able to join. I'm happy. Uh, nice thing is that uh, when I counted the countries, there were over 50 countries tonight. Okay, so welcome, welcome the world to, tonight. Okay, to, to this session. Uh, this is the third session. First one I offered about breaking organization silos. Then the second one last week by Dr. Brahim Shira about public-private partnership. Tonight we're going to have Antonio. Next week it will be Al Zaytoun uh, speaking about operational excellence and so on. So, first of all, Antonio, I met him in Accra, in Ghana, in, in PMI Africa conference, actually. Uh, he was, of course, keynote speaker. Back then he was the PMI uh, chairman uh, for board of directors. Uh, he's also uh, one of the Thinkers 50, which is an elite group of people. It's an award for selected few. Uh, he is also uh, a writer, international author. Uh, he writes, he has several books. He, he wrote some articles at Harvard Business Review. Uh, some of the interesting uh, thought leadership concepts we have in the world of project management, Antonio is behind all these so, and let's start the uh, presentation and i'm going to leave the floor to antonio thank you dr sadi so good evening everybody and it's a pleasure to be here in in your series of webinar sadi i'm very impressed with the first two i saw them and the quality is very high and i love to share knowledge and ideas and be provocative on the thinking. So <clears throat> this is what I wanted to share today. It's going to be a bit thought provoking. Um, and uh, I hope you learn a couple of things and help you to progress in your career, in your work and so on. Um, yeah, you already talked about me. I was the chairman of PMI in 2016. So I visited some of the PMI chapters around the world and it's like a big family. So I'm very happy to hear that so many chapters are part of this uh, series of webinars. So let me go to the next slide because I want to go straight into the content. Maybe you've heard already about the, the project economy. It's something that PMI recently last year, a few months ago, uh, launched as a big theme and I've been working on that for years. So I was pleased to see that PMI is embracing the concept. And I want to explain to you a little bit of what does it mean, at least from my point of view, my research. Then I will talk about a sensitive topic. I think project management will need to reinvent itself. So um, we always think that we are not going to be disrupted, that supply chains and banking and they're going to be disrupted. Boy, I think project management is going to be highly disrupted very soon. So we're going to talk about that and then I'll share briefly what are the skills needed to succeed in what I call a project driven world. So you heard statistics. This comes in the pulse of the profession or McKinsey. How many trillions of US dollars have to be invested uh, in the next 10 years, just on infrastructure, 57 trillion. This comes from McKinsey. And this was before the crisis. So just imagine the amount of projects that there will need to be right after the crisis to rebuild the economies around the world. So this number is small nowadays. The second statistic, this comes from PMI, claiming that 66 million are already project-based roles in the US that's going to go to 88. One third approximately of the jobs in the US are project-based. So these are things that 
we consider part of the project economy. I'm going to give you two additional data points, research that I did for my past book. <clears throat> Let me share, this is going to be a bit more like a, a test, a pool. So there is an application in Google called Ngram. Ngram, they have digitalized all the books they could find for the past 150 years. So it's a bit like Google Maps, but also for books. And in that big data analytics tool, you can search on terms. So I did a, quite some research and I selected eight highly used terms that we listen and we hear at work every day. I chose innovation, agile, project management, strategy, finance, sales, IT and operations. <clears throat> and you can see in the chart the evolution of these words over the period of the last 100 years. So there's one word which is today at the top. It was not at the top 50 years ago. You see that yellow brownish line, which is today at the top. So we're going to do a pool to see which for you is the top more written, more used, more spoken word in the business world. And you have here the eight options. So choose one option, please. Innovation, Agile, Project Management, Strategy, Finance. Which one is the one that is more published? So meaning more used, more read, more listened to. So I'm checking here the pool. I'll leave you 20 more seconds. And I'm going to end the pool. Thank you for voting. Thank you. So the pool, I don't know if you can see it on your right side, but I'm happy to see that project management, 41%, large majority says project management is the business term most widely used, followed by innovation and then agile and strategy, fine. Let me show you the reality. Oh, uh, sorry, there is um, an animation which I don't see here. No problem. I'll share with you what's the number one. The number one word most highly used is strategy. So here is strategy, not project management, unfortunately. So strategy is number one. Strategy was not very much used 50 years ago. It came only after the Second World War, and then business school started to teach strategy as the number one competencies course for all the MBAs and all the senior leaders. So that's where the ramp up. Number two and number three are sales. So companies need to sell. The first management business book was on sales. And the second line that you see there is operations. So there's a lot of literature and concepts around operations. So strategy, sales, operations. Sorry for project management. I also wish it would be on the top. So then you have concepts like finance and innovation. So these two here, finance and innovation. And then at the bottom, you have project management, IT, and agile. This is according to a research made through Google Ngram. So strategy is very, very high at the top, very high. Project management is very low at the bottom. We hope project management will be the best and the most recognized reality is no, there's a huge gap. Strategy matters, sales matters, operation matters, okay? There is one word and here you can see this course, so strategy, sales, operations, and then IT, project management. So there's a huge gap, and that's what I call the, the gap between projects and project management. There is, however, one word that everybody uses that is much more popular than strategy, that you see it, that you hear it, that you hear many times during the day, and that word is, 
you can type it quickly on the chat. What's the word that is more almost double use as strategy? Just type the word you think would be there. Okay. Okay. Culture, very important. Innovation, planning, yes. But it's not the word I'm looking. Strategy. Do I saw that. Somebody said project. Absolutely. Project is the number one word in business term. What does it tell you? Is that yes, companies are doing thousands of projects. Leaders are using the word projects. Uh, anybody around you is using the word, I start that project, I'm working on that project, I'm struggling with that project, but they're not using the word project management because that is very technical. That's how people perceive it. Project management is very technical. And I'm going to explain you as we follow on this presentation why I think it's very technical, why people don't want to learn about project management and how can we change that. So this is bad news because project management is at the bottom, really. We are not a fancy term, but projects are at the top. So that's an opportunity that is part of that project economy. And you see how it's moving high and very, very fast. The second statistic data point I want to share based on research is if you look to just one organization, I'm not talking about a project-based organization like a consulting company. I'm talking like a telecom <coughs> or a bank. Um, so 100 years ago, that organization would spend very little of their resources and their employees into project activities or change the business activities, the orange part at the top. 95% of the organization resources were dedicated to day-to-day -day activities. It was about running the business. Over the years, and this is 10 years, 20 years, management thinking, consulting companies have been advising companies, how can we do the blue part, the operations, more efficient, more productive, faster, cheaper, automated, so what you see is that these new technologies, new ideas like mass production, like total quality management, like ERP systems, like outsourcing, like the introduction of technologies uh, and IT, these were always addressing the blue part. So what happened? Yes, we're much more efficient. Yeah, we can do more with less people. So every year there's a slight shift between the resources. Companies are dedicating a bit more of their employees and their budgets to change activities. So this happens today. It's very small, so there's no big, uh, big uh, talking about it, but it's happening. It doesn't mean that the yellow orange part on the top, yeah, these are full-time people. Many people work in both sides. They have an operational role, and they have to do one or two or three projects at the same time. So this is a trend that's happening. Less resources on the operations shift towards project and change-based work. But there's something here very, very, very important. Um, very important. When artificial intelligence and robots will be mainstream in industries. It's the case today in banking. Most of the operational, the blue part is gone, is done by machines. So what's happened? There is a big, big shift. That shift is just accelerating. So many people working today in day-to-day -day activities in what we consider the hierarchical structure, in, that will disappear, is disappearing. And those resources are being sent to do projects. A good friend working in a big bank in France just lost his job, 20 years doing credit risk analysis. He was the head of the department. They say, as from tomorrow, this is done by machines. But we give you this project. 
So now you're doing this large transversal project. I don't have a clue how to do it, but I will learn. So this is happening massively. We'll see more and more people coming into the project space, project bear roles. So this is the second big element of the project economy. Macro level, more and more projects, and there will be more projects because of the crisis to turn around. It, within an organization, the type of work is moving from the hierarchical, the standard, the operations toward change and project-based role. So this is what <laughs> makes, I think, a very exciting moment for us, the project experts, because we can play a big role if we change, not if we remain as we are. This is very important. We will not succeed if we don't change, okay? <clears throat> so what are the consequences of this project economy? What's happening? What's the project revolution? This is a massive, massive point. And this is a true comment I heard from somebody uh, close. But Accenture did a research uh, last year, <coughs> uh, interviewed hundreds of executives, senior leaders, and one of the key findings of this result about the future of work, they say about 79% of the executives agree that the workforce of the future will be structured more than by projects than by job functions. So basically what I was telling you in the slide before, there's a shift. We, we don't need job descriptions. Do you all have a job descriptions in your work? I had. I've been working for 25 years. I think I had almost every time a job description. What does the job description say? <clears throat> well, this is what is expected to you from you in this role, and this is what you will need to do to progress in your career. Well, a company as large as IBM, they realize that people are not working in their job descriptions. They're working on the priorities. They're working on projects that need their skills and their resources. <clears throat> so to the point like a company like IBM is considering that canceling all the job descriptions. Imagine, imagine if in the company that you've been working, suddenly all the job descriptions disappear. This is panic, creates a lot of anxiety. We project people, we are used to it. We're used to move from one project to another, and we don't have like a very long term perspective, but people who have been working 15, 10, 20 years around the job description as accounting or marketing or sales, suddenly it's a big crisis. So I think this is one of the biggest consequences that we will not need job descriptions. It will be only project roles. You play that role in that project. And once the project is over, you move to the next one, maybe with a different role. For more experienced people, this is quite dramatic. For younger generations, millennials, they love it. Yes, when I talk to senior leaders and they say, I have problems with my millennial and, and generation, younger, they want to leave, they get bored. I say, give them project work. Give millennials project work. They love that. There's no hierarchy. They can talk with many people. After six months, they're done and they move to the next thing. Don't put them in the operations or the marketing or so, they get bored very quickly. So this is great for the younger generations, for me, <coughs> a bit more challenging. <coughs> the project revolution is happening in organizations. Board of directors are paying much more attention on the investments, on which projects are prioritized. They know that the future of their business is on the projects they choose and the way they implement them. So boards is not so much anymore about the risk and the audit committees, but they're starting to have strategy and strategy implementation skills and committees to follow up that. So the boards have to learn a lot about project oversight and project sponsorship and project selection. <coughs> education, those who have kids, education, the most effective way to have education is project-based, meaning give the kids a case study or a challenge and give them a week and put them in teams and let them come back in a week with options. That's the best way to learn it. People don't learn with a book and just read it. They play by doing it. 
And then governments, what you see more, more and more is not yet there, but collaboration between governments and uh, social <coughs> organizations and citizens working together to do projects uh, uh, for the good of the society or the city. This is Project Citizens in Ireland. They've done that many times. So that collaboration, policy implementation through projects is happening more and more. <clears throat> so this is great. One of the biggest consequences from a micro level in an organization is the tension between the day to day and the change. There's a big tension always between where do we focus? Should we focus on running the business today, flying the planes today, or should we focus on thinking about the next business model of organization? Where do we put the resources and so on? So this is <coughs> very, very challenging because there's no magic formula. There's no kind of objective formula, say, put 70% on the run of your business, 30% on the organization change. There are some ideas, there are some guidelines. Google, for example, will put 70 people, 70% 70 on today business, 20% on the next level of business, the future, and 10% on 20 years down the line. So these are good things. This friction creates silo mentality. And I know you covered that study in the first webinar, so I'm not going to cover that, but silo comes into play because of the friction between running a business and changing it. This is, you protect yourself. Um, companies work on what's urgent and short term, so there's no long-term vision on, on working on there. There's companies which are a bit complicated in terms of strategic goals and priorities. Too many or people don't understand. Um, one big issue is too many projects. One of the challenges of our profession is that it's very easy to start projects. For many companies, it doesn't cost anything. How do you start a project in a company? You call a kickoff meeting. Yeah, that's all. And the next day, people will show in the kickoff meeting because uh, people love to start ideas. The people you invited, people you didn't invite, they will be in your kickoff meeting. Will they come to your second meeting when you start looking at the scope and defining things and allocating tasks? No, people will not show. Yeah, we like to start. We love to start. We don't like to finish. We don't like to execute. So <clears throat> I've been working with several companies that have more projects than resources. There are 600 employees. They have 900 projects. How can you manage your business and change it with 900 projects and 600 people? So this is an area where we can play a big role, defining what is a project, when to start a project, Never start a project if you don't finish a project or two or cancel. So this is very important. Resource planning, a big issue, could be a whole, whole webinar around that. PPM tools and lack of engagement. So these are consequences of this friction between <clears throat> the organizations. So good news, well, good news. Project management is at the bottom. But there's a lot of projects. There will be more projects. There's going to be more project-based work. <clears throat> but if you look at statistics on the actual performance of projects today, performance of how many projects succeed from all the ones we have, it's very mediocre, I would say. Most statistics say one out of three projects are successful. Maybe one out of four or five. Yeah, depends where you look at the statistics. That is really poor. That is not possible anymore. We need to, I think PMI says that every 20 seconds we're losing a million because of bad project management. This is not acceptable from a value creation point of view, from a sustainable sustainability point of view. This is not possible anymore. We need to get better. And I'm talking about we as project managers, but I mean general leadership organizations would need to get better in doing the right projects and executing, implementing right. Imagine if suddenly, instead of one project out of four, we have two or three projects out of four. Imagine that are successful. Imagine the value that we create for organizations, 
for countries, for cities, for employees, for us. So we need to be much better into implementation. There's another warning here, big, big warning message. Gartner says that in 10 years, 80% of what we do today as project managers will be taken over by artificial intelligence. <clears throat> We've been very happy to talk about disruption everywhere because it means change projects for us. But I hardly ever heard anybody raising the bell saying, well, project management, you're going to be highly disrupted too. So this is scary because they're very right. I don't know if it's going to be 80%, but 50, 60%, yes, it's going to be very different. Back to the pool. So where do you think artificial intelligence will reshape, will impact project management? A, reshaping the project life cycle, making project management simple and accessible, changing how we measure project success, or shift the skills of project managers to soft skills. Sorry, there's a typo. <coughs> so go to the pool and tell me whether you think it will be on A, B, C, or D. I'll give you 20 seconds. Clearly, it's about shifting the skills towards soft skills, empathy, leadership. That I can see here is a big majority. Let me end the poll. So, yes. Uh, first on the skills, soft skills, definitely. Then we talk about reshaping the project life cycle, making project much, much simpler, and changing how we measure. Uh, all of the four answers are correct, and I'm going to talk about them as next part of my presentation. Just wanted to assess where are your views. You're all right. Okay, I'm going to tell you my views. This is just my views, my research. Uh, happy to hear other views and, and be challenged. This is something we build together. Three areas I think that project management will need to change. First, we need to simplify the framework. Second, we need to look at the project life cycle differently. And third, I think we need to find something different than the triple constraints. Simplification is one of the most difficult things to do. If you think about management theories, what comes to mind? <clears throat> one of the first most important management frameworks is the five forces of Michael Porter. Five forces. You can put it in one slide. Everybody can talk about the strategy of a business with one slide. One slide, imagine, you don't need to be a PhD in strategy, but you can have a good discussion around the strategy of your business. Same for marketing, it's just one slide. We call it the seven Ps of Kotler. Seven Ps, and we can discuss the marketing of a business. You're going to change management. We have Kotler, the eight steps, this is, Quite simple, everybody can apply that, understand the basics, maybe not to the 100%, but 20, 30, 40%, anybody can understand. <clears throat> One of the biggest success factors, or why was successful the Agile wave and the Agile movement was because it was super simple. One page, Agile Manifesto, the principles, the fourth, topics they're talking, that's it, simplification. Yeah, people, product, value versus process, that's it, everybody could use it, could employ it. Let me go back to the next pool. When was the first edition of the PM book published? This is not a PMP exam test, just general knowledge about the PM book. <clears throat> so you have here, Four options, 1994, 1996, 1999, 1969. 
Tell me what you think. Okay, it's getting close, yes. Uh, getting there. I'm talking about the first edition, not the first draft. Okay. I close the poll. Got it, 1996, that's correct, very good. 1994, the first draft was published. 1969 is when PMI was established, first time, when the people got together. The second question on this slide is how long was the first PM bot? And here I'm not going to test you. I had to check it anyway, so I'm not expecting anybody to know this. But let me show you a table which is a bit shocking. Exposure draft 1994, so you see the different editions until the sixth edition, but I want that you pay attention on the column which says pages. The first exposure draft had 64 pages, something like this, tiny. You could read in, a, in one day or one night, done. But have you seen the exponential growth in complexity of project management according to the PM bot? 756 pages. This is extraordinary. I think this is great for people who really want to deep dive into project management, who are eager to learn, who will learn everything about it. But this is maybe 5% of the population who's using projects or doing project management, maybe 1%. We don't have anything simple. So anybody who's doing projects around you, in your business, in your organizations, they will never ever in their lives even touch the PM bot. It's scary. Okay, we love it and it's great, but people outside will not touch it. They will not ever come across. So that's why the gap I was telling you project management is at the bottom because it's extremely technical. It's kind of scary when you see these kind of books. So I'm proposing, I'm working, and this is just a, a draft, a project canvas, one page. In one page, Anybody who wants to know a bit about projects should be able to do it through questions and 14 areas, which you probably recognize here. So why are we doing the project, the business case, but also the purpose, the really why we do it, the executive sponsorship and the governance, key aspects on the who, then you see all the knowledge areas of the PM block, and then you see the where. So is, are you a project-based organization or not? So with this, I think you don't need to have, and to read the PM book, to have a good discussion with anybody around the table to talk about projects, any kind of projects. And I've used this more than two, 300 times, and it's been used in some organizations. I am reshaping this together with the guys of the business model canvas, Alex Osterwald. So we want to connect the business model canvas with the project canvas so that they can be used together. So this is just for your information. You'll get the copy. Any feedback is much welcome. I created the project manifesto. So it's a co-working co thing. This is just, I put the ideas, this is in LinkedIn, but I do think we need a manifesto too, not for project management. I would talk about projects and you have here the list of the 12 principles. Anybody can comment. Okay, we acknowledge that governments implement policies through projects. We believe projects are the lingua franca of governance. So you can read that, you can go to the linking. Uh, I think this is not probably the final version. This is something that we are building together. But people should have that in one page. One page you have the manifesto, one page you have the canvas, and we can compete with Agile, and we can compete with strategy because people will start loose using it talking the terms and so on. Second big transformation. The way we've learned project management life cycle is what you see in white. Initiation, planning, implementation, handover. We don't care what happens in innovation. We've not learned, we don't know. Uh, it's not our business, we don't care. We don't care what happens in the run. It's, it's operations or marketing or sales, it's not my problem. Benefits, pff, 
I prefer not to care too much. This is who knows, the owner or the business, or but it's not really my center part of the work. I just deliver the deliverables and that's it. That's the past story. That's not how the projects will work in the future. I think artificial intelligence is going to take over the white part. Initiation, they're going to prepare brilliant business cases and scenarios. They're going to do great planning with different plans and options. They're going to do all the reporting. So implementation also about 50% of project management time in implementation is reporting, chasing reports and producing reports. That will be gone. The part of implementation which will stay is the execution, the motivation, the soft skills, the making teams, creating high performing teams. Yes, that's going to continue. The handover shrink. The focus of project management in the future to succeed, the disruption will be on the ends. Ideation, we need to learn design thinking. We need to know when a project is a project because that's one of the biggest issues. We start projects too quickly. There is a phase in a project which is about innovation, ideation, defining the options, learning the, the technology before we launch the project. Most businesses launch the project in that phase and that's completely wrong. That's where your scope is not defined. That's where the solution is not clear. Just an example, the iPhone. The first idea of the iPhone was shared with Steve Jobs 2001. The project started to build the iPhone, was called Project Purple, started in 2004. Three years later, after the idea was presented, because Steve Jobs said, it's not the right time. We're focused on the iTunes and the iPod. Explore. Yeah, think about smartphones, but he set up a very, very tiny team to explore and learn and design thinking and reduce the options from 100 type of smartphones to two. Once he said it's time for a project, he said the best thing, 100% dedicated in two years and a half to set the project. So that part is going to be fundamental. We need to learn about that. The running is another part I'm going to cover, but the benefits is going to be our most important priority. Most important before the deliverables, imagine. And this is an example I want to share here. So the iPhone I talk, this is an hospital in Brussels. Uh, I saw starting of the construction 2016, finish of the construction of the hospital, 2020. That's four years, very fast. But inauguration of the hospital, 2018, two years before the closure of the project. Why? because they wanted to get benefits before the project was over. So after two years, half of the business was operation. They were delivering babies. They were treating cancer. They were operating. Half of the, bu the building was still on construction. Here's the picture. We need to plan on benefits. We cannot plan anymore on deliverables. This is the end. B big change changes everything the way we think. We need to plan on benefits. Where are the benefits of my project and how can I plan them? I want to see the benefits in my timelines, in my milestones, not so much the deliverables or artifacts. Those are the past. Radical change. I told you I will push a bit on your thinking. The last very radical change I'm proposing is we all know this. We love the golden rule, the triple constraints. We love, we've learned. That's the first thing you learn when you go into project management. That's all. That's the past too. The triple constraint is inward focus. It doesn't provide any idea on the value of the project. It doesn't tell you about the engagement of the people. It doesn't talk about the risk. Yes, these are important aspects. Don't get me wrong of a project. Very important. But that's the internal kitchen. Sometimes the deadline is something that matters a lot. Sometimes the cost. But this is my internal kitchen. When you go to a restaurant, you don't want to know the time or the cost or the scope of the dish that you're eating, how much time it took to cook, and how much cost to build. You want to taste and say, this is amazing. This tastes amazing. We need to learn to talk differently. That's how we build engagement. Last test for you, pull. Let me just prove you what I'm telling you. 
So imagine you have to assess a project. This project was going to take four years. So you schedule for four years and budget for 7 million. It took 14 years, not four, 14 years to be completed. It costed 102 million, not seven. Sorry, a little bit more than expected. Tell me, what's the, your score? Let's go to the pool. How would you score this project? Terrible, completely red. Amber, we're used to these kind of delays. And great job, Green, well done. Absolutely, terrible, if we use our metric. If we use our metric, let me end the point here. You know which project I'm talking. So absolutely right. According to our KPIs, this is a terrible project. I'm talking about the Sydney Opera House. Imagine, according to our metrics, we could have stopped this project and this project could have never happened. After four years, we could have stopped it because they were not doing it right. You know this project, after the first year, they recovered the 100 million that they went over. Why project management is not able to say, well, this project, actually the value that is bringing is much more than your trickle constraints, and we need to continue. So I think that we need to add, I'm not saying we need to, to skip the triple constraints, but move that internal kitchen. I think we need to start thinking about a relevance triple constraint, which will be around the value of the project, the risk that we're taking, the sustainability of the benefits and the impact of the project and the benefits. This one is the one we want to share with the public. This is what will help us to sell the project and continue selling. I think there's a second triple constraint that we need to think which is about the engagement. If you don't get the people engaged, your project will be a disaster. So there needs to be engagement about the clarity of the purpose and the passion and the dedication of the people. You can be passionate, but if you don't put 50% uh, of your time, just do once every two weeks, that doesn't help. We need dedicated people in our projects. So I think there needs to be a triple constraint about the engagement. What I'm <coughs> presenting here, sorry, this is work in progress. So I'm not saying this is the definitely, but we need to evolve the profession to talk about the engagement, the purpose, the why, and the value, the benefits, the sustainability of our projects. And I'm going to finish on, yes, okay, you've changed all the way you think. I think about projects, you're disrupting everything I've learned. Um, you are giving me good messages, but also challenging the way we project. So how can I do it? What do we, what should I do to be successful? I told you at the beginning, the future is right if we change the way we do things. Um, I do believe that if we change, we, we could be the CEOs of the future. We should be the CEOs of our projects. I think we can become the CEOs of many organizations small, large, public sector, <coughs> but we need to evolve. And I'm going to tell you <coughs> a real story. All the stories I tell are true from the research. This is a good friend. We were kids, we were playing together, doing uh, games when we were kids and fighting and all these things that you do when you're a kid. He started working in Microsoft, selling Microsoft Office, products in Madrid, in Spain. He did that for several years. At one point, they asked him if he could uh, lead one project. Microsoft was not a player in the ERP market, SAP, Oracle. Microsoft was not there. It's a huge business. So they say Microsoft wants to compete in the ERB, ERP business. They bought a, a, a Nordic company called Navision. They were known in Europe, they were good into ERP. And they asked Tesser, do you want 
to lead that project. So forget about your sales role and jump into this integration. So we need to integrate our small ERP division with Navision and make one organization, Microsoft ERP services. Cesar, do you want to do that project? And Cesar, yes, yes, I do it. I'll certify or learn about project management for three years. He led that project, three years. He led that project. And after the three years, successful project, I asked this, sir, what did you do next? How can you become president of Microsoft for Asia and Pacific when you've been doing a project like that? And I asked him, this, sir, which project did you take next? I can't imagine you would have chosen anything you wanted because you were very successful with that big transformation project. And Cesar said, Antonio, wait, I didn't ask to take another project. I say, what? No, I didn't say to take a project. I told my bosses, I want to run the new business that my project has delivered. There's nobody in this Microsoft organization that knows more about the new business than me. So I want to run it. I want to have the team. I want to have a PNL. I want to deliver the results. This was an eye opener. We are in a project management silo. We move from project to project to project for 20, 30, 40 years. But the key aspect here that there's very few people that know more about what our projects do than us. So why do we stop at one point? Why don't we deliver? the value of what we've built. Why don't we say, well, I'm going to run this application or I'm going to run this building or I'm going to do that. Let me do it. This is how we learn the skills needed to be successful in the project world. We need to stretch, we need to move on. So this is an eye opener, again, very disruptive on the way we think today. So I think project management of the future will be an end-to-end -end project manager. We we'll need to know design thinking. We need to know when a project is a project and when is the right time to start a project. We'll execute it with a lot of artificial intelligence and <coughs> automation. We'll focus on the people, high performing teams, focusing on the value and the benefits. And sometimes we'll be running that project till the end. Already happening in China, Alibaba, this is how they work. You have an idea. You have a project, you execute, and then you're accountable for making that idea a business for two, three years. Okay? So this is the formula. Sometimes move out of your comfort zone and develop those skills. <clears throat> so just to finish and leave a bit of time for, for questions, I think the future is right, the future of projects. There are actually very few ways of working and collaborating, more motivating and inspiring than being part of a project with an ambitious goal, a higher purpose, and clear fixed spec time. This is what we all remember when we are done with our careers. We remember the projects we work on, the tough projects, but we deliver something in as a team, something that make an impact. And, and this is, I think, a way to finish my, my talk is, yes, this is the future. The future is right, but we need to change our approach, our frameworks, and the skills that we need to build. Um, so Sadi, that's it. Maybe a couple of points on the strategy implementation. Uh, this is something that I'm very proud to announce here. It's almost uh, on exclusivity at the beginning. We're just launching, but I always felt that there was no career path for project managers. They, they would move into agile or project for program management portfolio, but still in the project management silo which is great, but I think what we needed is some more strategic uh, credentials. So I, I, I built a course, a certification, unfortunately not yet with PMI, this is APMG. PMI, I hope they will come later on, but they are in working on some area, different areas, more the younger. So APMG is partnering with this, with the Institute of Strategy Implementation, to provide a new credential for, uh, for people who want to progress in their career. Sadi. Thank you very much, Antonio. This is quite interesting. Uh, we have uh, uh, a zillion questions. So 
Uh, let me first of all, uh, yeah. <laughs> before, before we take questions, I'd just like to uh, invite uh, everybody to uh, join us in next week's uh, webinar with Al Zaytoun. And Hi, this is Al Zaytoun from, from Washington, D.C. USA. I look forward to interacting with you on the Advisors Webinar titled Balancing People, Process and Governance for Operational Sustainability. See you then. So long. See you then. So long. Good to see you all. Maybe, Sadi, I didn't show the last slide. I completely forgot. There is a, we've, together with you, with advisor, we have a special deal, maybe. Um, so we, you'll get this through the PDF, but we're offering a special discount, 50% uh, using advisor as a code. We'll share that, I guess, um, Sadi, later on. Sadi, I don't hear you. Maybe just me? No, no, okay, okay, again. Um, so, uh, probably we're gonna do another session, more like a panel, yeah. with you and your, the co-founder. Can you rem rem uh, remind us what his name? Yeah, Robin Spekulan. He's one of the gurus on strategy implementation in Asia, Singapore. Okay, uh, so probably we're gonna do, we're gonna assign a couple of weeks a panel and discuss this in, in, in more detail because it requires a whole session by itself. So let me try to, to get some, some questions. Uh, I think there are lots of, of questions and uh, There's a thankfully lot Mustafa. Yes, there is a question from uh, uh, Ahmed Khrizet. He, he, he's, he's going to be one of our speakers. Oh. Uh, he's doing his his DBA at Schema Business School, the one I did my PhD in, and he's a very, very professional business development uh, project manager. Mm -hmm. So he says he's speaking about considering business opportunity a project. Do you think that people work during the opportunity life cycle should execute the project? It's a great question. I, I like the question because it's a difficult answer to that question. But yes, in some cases, I believe that you will be maybe not executing the project, but prototyping, making some prototypes um, to test some ideas during that phase, the business opportunity. You will do some prototyping and, and narrow up the, the choices. I think now we do it, but not formally. So yes, I think so. I think, and if you read, read, read on the graph, uh, the guru on strategy, she says something around that too. So yes, great question. I do think that will happen. Okay. And now there is uh, um, more than one person who wanted to join in. Uh, I'm opening the door uh, if they are still on. There is a Mrs. Ikhlas uh, from Ministry of Health, I, be I believe. She wanted to, to join in. Uh, also, there was another question by... If they happen, happen to see, uh, they might join in. Now, let me go to another question. Um, we have, uh, do you think the definition of project would also be changing? Because projects are def defined as temporary effort and has a termination date, but the benefits of the project continue. In the future, we would be more talking about the value instead of the golden triangle. Uh, I think there's something on that. I, I don't have an answer, Sadi, in the question. But I think there's going to be a conversion between project and product management. 
Um, I think we need to become a bit product managers too. And it's part of my, uh, my ideas behind what I share. I do think that we keep the word project, but we look at things more holistically. Um, mm. But yes, it's, it's all temporary nowadays and, and that will come faster and faster. So I think projects will continue, but we we'll merge with products and we look holistically, we'll use the business um, opportunity to do some work there. So good question. Okay, another question. Uh, Walid Jaman is saying, don't you think by moving from job description to project employees, uh, we will gonna lose the benefit of moving upscale and their grade within their organization? I think that's spot on, yes. The hierarchies, the way we've seen them, will slowly disappear. We'll see other type of career paths, like my friend Cesar. He moved from sales to project to becoming the CEO of the product, the new organization. So I think that the transition will not be up for hierarchical, but we'll do different type of roles. Sometimes we'll lead big teams. Sometimes we'll lead small teams but you will see career progression in a very different way. Okay. I have a question from Freddy Quick. He said, I attended a product webinar yesterday and the presenter said, we need to move from being project focused to product focused. Distinction is one, uh, one is rigid, the other is experimental. Not strive for perfection. What's your view? Is it either or or finding balance? I think it's finding balance. I think there has been always this clash between product owners, project owners, product owners got into the lead with Agile. They wanted to delete all the project in the team. I think thanks to the project economy, the project revolution, the statistics that you saw, projects are taking the lead now. But we need to adapt some of the concepts of Agile. We need to adapt some of the product management technique when we talk about the launch of the product, the commercial viability of the product, these are things that we often never care. We need to care. So I think it's going to be us kind of embracing the product management, but we need to change, we need to learn. Okay. Uh, another okay. question. I yes. have a question for you. What do you think about all this? Okay, uh, you did not tell me to prepare myself before. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nevertheless, yes, actually, uh, I'm, I'm a solid believer for integration and for the integrated project management, uh, or what I call it is integrated management framework, okay, life cycle framework. Uh, the, the whole framework, integrated life cycle management framework, which was my paper that I won PMI Snyder award, award for, yeah. Also in 2016, okay, it was a good year. Uh, when when we met actually in in, uh, in California, uh, and, and you gave me the award, Antonio. I have a picture with you, okay, the P my standard award. So that 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 research that I did and that that paper was all about integration. That project managers cannot live in an island, cannot be by themselves. They can do nothing without operations. Then when I went more into my work uh, implementing portfolio management frameworks for government organizations, mainly in the GCC, I found out that in many cases, they focus their portfolio, they say a portfolio of project, but this defeats the purpose because portfolios are meant to realize value. Yeah. And it is the operation that realizes value, whereas projects and programs, they produce new value or give you more competency for the operation to earn the value. So it's, it's, like, it's like the front and the back okay, of, of the coin. You, you need both sides. You cannot live with, with only one leg. Okay? Uh, but I totally agree that uh, 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 a lot of CEOs or top managers, they do not understand the true value of the project-driven discipline because they are not aware about it. Okay? I remember once when you, when you spoke about a uh, hundred uh, international schools that offer MBA, mm -hmm. and you found, I think, only one or two that teach project management. Two, yeah. only two, only two, okay? 
Now, I think this changed in the past five years. I think more, more, more of these people. But this tells us why the CEOs or the leaders of ma major companies, they do not endorse project management simply because they don't know it. They don't know the value of, of, of project management. And plus, whenever we talk about project management for the top people, it's more like portfolio management because nobody's going to manage with his own hands. It's about sponsoring projects, okay, and knowing how to uh, select the projects and monitor their KPIs in order to realize the value and the strategy of the, of the organization. So whatever you, you said tonight makes total sense, okay? I think it's, it's the same story, okay? But I, I have hopes for, for the future. Now, we have exceeded our time by two minutes, and there are still several questions, and we have 213 people showing with us. Would you like to extend the session for 10 more, more minutes to answer more questions? Of course, for the 214 people in sure. Okay, so you focus on value, not on the time constraint. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so let me uh, go and select another question. Uh, our friend from Tasnia, he's asking what is the importance of benefit realization for a project manager? A manager. I think so far it has not been really important. It's not something that it's a nice to have. It's a nice addition. What I think and what I believe strongly, it should be the number one priority. We should define the scope. We should define the plan. Focus on the benefit. Focus on the value. Um, because that's what people are expecting. This is how you create engagement. This is how you get top management support. There are looking forward to see value what is in for them so i think today is more nice to have it has not picked up benefit management it has been fight for many times i think now we need to find a way to integrate it in our day to day we should have a benefit plan before we have a plan because that will determine how we plan before we determine the scope and then we plan I think we now we need to determine the benefit, and then we plan, we scope, and then we execute. Okay. Now I have three or four questions from friends of mine. Oh. One of them is yes, Ramiz Al Habib. Ramiz is, is the director, is the GM of the JACA. He was responsible for the international uh, airport at Jeddah, which had lots of problems. And after he took took over things became well and they started to actually went into operation of over phases. So I, I, I would love to have Ramiz speak with us in the future. Okay, he has great yeah. value. He has a note, thank you for the nice talk and slides. It's about time that we think out of the box. I love your ideas about no job description and obtaining benefits before the end of the project, which I believe what he did on, 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 that, on that project. Thank you, Ron. And and what I'm sharing here, study, I want to make it clear to everybody. It's something we need to co-create. I don't want to be the owner of this thinking. If we want to be successful, it's something that we all need to embrace and build together. So like Ron is saying and endorsing, I'm sure all of you have good points. We need to find a way to build this together. OK. Thank now I have a Another question from my friend Ibrahim Shira, he was our speaker last week. He oh. said, can we generalize this notion, given that we have different types of projects with different complexities? And I know exactly what he's talking about because he's the guy who managed huge infrastructure projects and now he's managing quality of life projects for Vision 2030, which deals a lot with the social and the economic impact of, of the lives of people. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, of different and diverse complex projects. I love uh, your talk last week on PPP. I love it. I think uh, what I'm talking here is more principles. Uh, it's a bit generic. It's about breaking up the traditions that we have to, to reach the next level. But this doesn't apply to all the type of projects. There's projects like the ones you're doing for 2030, which need much more of the traditional project management methods 
but we need to embrace some of the new thinking. So I completely agree. This doesn't apply to all the type of projects. It's more a mindset. It's something that we just need to keep in mind and apply where we can. But I do think that, yes, we still need the best part of the old project management or the current project management, but bring it to the next level. So thank you for your question and the great presentation. Okay, another question from Saeed Mubarak from Aramco. He is also the president for an organization for uh, digital technologies for oil and gas. He will be one of our speakers also. Uh, in, in the next batch of 14 speakers, he, he took, he's asking about the success rate of projects as you indicated as one to three. The ingredients to successful projects have not changed. The role of leaders is unmatched. If leaders do not change their mindset, how would success rate would change? Chai, thank you for the question. Great question. I think that's one of the most challenging parts. If the senior leaders don't embrace uh, the change in the new mansion and that sometimes they need to shift the best resources to the most important projects, like Steve Jobs did, um, if this will not happen or will happen very slow. I think it's part of the big change that we need to bring is education of senior leaders. I can tell you that my role as a project manager moved from maybe spending 1% of my time when I was a junior educating senior leaders in my projects to 50 to 60 to 70%. So I think the evolution of the natural role of a project manager has to focus much more on the education of the senior leaders and pulling down the sponsor, saying, sponsor, if you're not here, the project will collapse. It's your accountability. I want to see you every week. So I think it's they will need to be uh, convinced of the value of projects and becoming a project-driven structure and being better at prioritization and selection. But we need to play a big, big role. We are playing a big role. We can stretch and push further. So Said, yes, if this doesn't happen, it will be very hard to achieve that change in mindset. But we can. I think people like you, Said, we can convince senior leaders of the importance of projects, the importance of sponsorship. And I think we're getting there. I can see it. Okay, uh, another question from Shingitai Shikara. I hope I pronounced this right. Do you see strategy as more important in implementation or right up front on project selection and how to implement them? Good question. I think this is going to be a great question when we have the seminar around strategy implementation. I think there is more and more conversion between projects and strategy implementation, for sure. In the past, the role of strategy was 80% around crafting and strategic thinking and strategic analysis. 20% was about implementation. This is something too detailed, we don't care, operations. Today, the leading organization spent 80% on strategy implementation and 20% on the thinking because they don't mind. Sometimes it's better to have a wrong strategy implemented than not having a strategy at all because you learn with the failure. So I think there is a uh, race of the importance of project space of strategy. And that's where I think we will be having great discussions when we talk about uh, this new institute and the certification around strategy implementation professional, bringing us to a bit higher level. Great question, thank you. Another great question from Ikhlas al Rashud, uh, Ministry of Health in Saudi. From a personal experience, lack of job description and clarity on roles may cause chaos in the workplace. How do you manage that? And what kind of messages should be delivered to your teams and staff to mini minimize this chaotic effect and increase motivation in the workplace? Great question and a big risk. What you mentioned there, you need to have some project roles, definitely. You need to have 
um, a description on what people are doing. Um, but you need to leave some freedom. The high performing teams, they have roles, but there's freedom to try to fail. I love, I'm a big fan of football. Um, soccer, they call it in the US. I don't know why, but football. I'm a Real Madrid fan. So in Real Madrid, you have 11 players. You need to have roles in a project, in a football team. There's a goalkeeper, there's people in the defense. There's freedom we feel, but they have freedom to move up and down a bit. And yes, there's a bit of overlaps, but good project teams, they understand each other. They know their skills. They know how they can complement. Of course, I'm generalizing a bit. When you're talking with a project of 2,000 people, you need to be much more granular. You need to let people know what you're expecting from them. So, yes, it's a great question. I'm... I'm just trying to sell a bit more the principle. People need to have a bit of freedom to, to try, to fail, so that they will feel comfortable with the project. But absolutely, you need some structure, some expectations, some complementary skills to make the project successful. Yes, great question. Thank you. Okay, okay. so I'll try to take two or three more questions before we close. Uh, and this is from... Uh, Sameh, Sameh Maki, we worked together four years in Mecca, uh, oh. six or seven years back, yeah. He's saying the PMPs encounter many difficulties applying the project management standard. How to let the decision makers provide the required resources and facilities to do a good job while managing the project? Yeah, you spot on again. All the questions are great. Your audience is very smart, Sadi. They know all the top challenges that we're facing. And, and of course, you cannot do a project without the right resources and, and people working part time and doing a day to day job plus the project. I think this is only going to change when senior leaders understand that they need to staff their projects, the more strategic projects, with the best people. I always talk to senior leaders about the first iPhone. When Steve Jobs decided to create the first phone, when he decided to launch the best the project, not the three years of exploration, when the day he said, we move into a project, he selected the best people in Apple. He said, yeah, you're the director of marketing. You want to join? Yes, I want to join. So it was voluntary. And he said, I wanted to work tomorrow in that building for the next two years and a half. Leave your place here. And he said, Who's going to do my job? I'm director of marketing. Don't worry about that. Somebody else will take care. So when we'll see that organizations will say, my best team to the most strategic project, we'll get there. Because you can achieve anything you want when you have the best resources and others to develop. But it's true that it's a big challenge. We're educating senior leaders, and we need to keep pushing to under make them understand that you need to shift resources quickly. You need to place them in where the big pets of the running the business is should not be taking the most talented resources. That was 30, 20, 40 years ago. The most talented people need to move into the future of the organization. Very interesting Sorry. point. And, yeah, very interesting point. I have a question from uh, one of the uh, colonels from the Lebanese army, my friend, he said, can such change in the definition and implementation of project management be enforced in the public sector, especially organizations that have been working for a long time with conventional silos? Precisely that's where we need to force the change. I think silos, Sadi, I'm not going to talk about that. You are the guru. But there's nothing better to break silos, to create a project culture, to work as a team, to work with a purpose, common goal, shared vision, all together. So absolutely, I think the public sector, I've seen some big changes. I've seen now, especially with the crisis, calling up for help from the society, from citizens, working in projects, supporting projects. They don't yet have the full trust on that they want to keep the power, but some parts in some countries, 
you can see in that binome that all working together um, to make it happen. So I hope that happens everywhere. It's going to take time, but definitely you have great examples that we can share about that converge between projects, politics, policies, implementation, and society to do great projects together for cities or um, environmental causes. So not there yet, but I think we'll see that happen. There are lots of more questions, uh, but I, I we, we need to, to, to wrap it up. So I'm gonna close in a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm just going to, 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 to take uh, one question from our friend Farah. She's saying, is PMI planning, uh, will PMI planning be used to embrace the innovative futuristic PM changes? And another, another question similar, more or less, from our friend Mabrouk Mabrouk from, from Tunisia, our dear friend. Uh, he's talking about, is the Pinbook 7 edition, will it include the project economy revolution presented here? Ah, oh, Mabrouk, uh, Mabrouk, I would love to, but uh, <laughs> I think what we're talking is complementary. Uh, again, I don't have anything against the PM Bok. I think it's great, 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 but it's just for a minority, and we need to just find a way to bridge that, to transfer all that concepts into something a bit more simple. Remember, strategic, you can do it in, in, in a page with five forces. So how can we evolve to have that connection? But I'm not sure, I think PMI has embraced the project economy, uh, but what latest I saw PMI was looking more into the younger generation and the millennium, trying to embrace them educate them into the project uh, world, which is, I think, great. We're building the professionals of the future, not so much in the high end, people like us or the, the strategy or so. That was not their priority uh, last time I saw. So I think hopefully they will to embrace this because we want a future also for, for us and evolution, but it was not the priority last year when I heard what they wanted to focus on. Okay, well, here I, I'm gonna say one thing in, in defense of PMI, actually. Yeah. Uh, which, is, which, is, which is, many judge PMI just because of the pin book. Now, the pin book contains, it's like a dictionary. It contains lots of good practices. Uh, you don't learn a language from a dictionary. The pin book in, in, in the first place is meant for experienced project managers from the field. Those who really have over 4,500 hours of project management experience, then they learn the conceptualized uh, processes of the, of the PIN book, pass the exam, and after they pass it, with some time, I believe they become better project managers because they mix the experience they have with the standards, with the terminology that gets over 1 million certified PMPs and want to speak the same language, which is great. Now, on the other hand, when we talk about organizational project management, which, which is the thing that we need, which links strategy to the execution, talks about benefit realization and, and things like that, they have standards for portfolio and the certification, standard for program management and the certification. They have things about benefit realization and so on. The problem is that they have a lot of content, over 30 different standards and guidelines and if you have the time and the effort and the passion to read all of them and start to decrypt them because all of these are conceptualized, okay? Uh, again, you cannot learn a language from a dictionary, okay? Yeah. You need a tutor to help you do that. Once you have this, you, you have a lot of, of the needed knowledge, okay? But and I'm with you, Sasha, I think it's a must. I would highly... Yeah. Uh, I always recommend to do the PMP. I think maybe you don't use the concepts all the time, but it gives you a very solid basis to understand the world of projects. Yes. So I, I completely agree yeah. with you. I'm just talking more about the next step and the evolution around yes. organizational project management, strategic part. Yeah. Very good. And thank you for keeping, uh, for keeping you late, keeping everybody with us. We still have 179, but I think it's time to say thank you very much for attending. Thank you, first of all, Antonio, 
like always, I've never attended a presentation for you and uh, went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was always on, on my toes, enjoying, trying to think, because you have this thing of provoking people to think, okay, to get them out of the box, which is beautiful, something we, we all need, especially in, in, in COVID-19, post-COVID-19 area, a, a place where we have too many questions Okay, now nobody has all the answers. It's, it's a discovery. We're gonna go all agile and adapt and, and go and try and make mistakes and learn from these mistakes until, until we all together hopefully uh, uh, su survive and, and, and go stay on our feet and become stronger again. So thank you, thank you Antonio and thank you all, all the attendees with us. Uh, with this, I will, we'll have to, to close our session tonight. Thank you very much. Antonio, I think you are the administrator because I went off, so you have to turn the session off. I cannot turn it from my side. Okay, it's an honor okay. to close the session, Shadi. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, thank you for everybody that listened. I hope we can connect. Um, uh, reach out to LinkedIn. We'll share my email so that you can connect. Thank you, Shadi. You're doing great for the project management community. I love your webinars and I love to see so many people joining and they're all all smart, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Take care. That's it. Thank you, thank you. Good night, bye-bye. Bye. My name is Dr. Saadi Amra. I'm offering a webinar, Breaking Organizational Silos During the Times of Social Distancing. Join me soon. This is Dr. Ibrahim Shira speaking to you from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We will be focusing on public-private partnership contracts and privatization contracts. See you. Hi, my name is Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. I was the chairman of the Project Management Institute in 2016. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, why project management needs to reinvent itself and project managers too. So I look forward to seeing you in my webinar. Hi, this is Al Zaytoun from Washington DC, USA. I look forward to interacting with you on the advisors webinar titled Balancing people, process, and governance for operational sustainability. See you then. So long. Hi there. I'm Radia Benaglia from Algeria. I'll be talking to you about emotional intelligence, leadership, and transformational change. I hope you're well. Stay safe. This is Mustafa Fuzolu from Turkey. I'm offering you a webinar with advisors on digital project management. Hi, I'm Dr. Sean Reagan from California and Prague. Now we're presenting a webinar with advisors on opportunities in crisis and complex situations, so please join me.